that I hear you in Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord Jesus. Can you please take your seat in God's presence? I welcome us one more time to God's house this evening. I want to welcome us to the presence of Jesus. Last week we started with a, a, a series. And then I was talking about the, the place of love in victory. But our topic was love, the way to victory. And last week we actually dwelt on what love is scripturally. Looking at the scriptural description of what love is. And last week I told us that we are going to be looking at a case study from the Bible. That will actually point us to how we can demonstrate love. To attain or to obtain victory. Because I said last week emphatically that victory is not what you attain. Victory is what you obtain. And why do we use that statement? Because we said that because Christ had given us victory already. So as believers, we don't fight for victory alone. We fight from victory to victory. I'm not fighting as one who is trying to struggle to get victory by my strength. No. But I'm fighting with the understanding that the enemies that I'm fighting, they are defeated foes already. The devil is a defeated foe. Christ defeated him long ago on the cross. And therefore, when believers are fighting or are engaged in spiritual warfare, we are, somebody should switch off the fan there. We don't need it. I don't think we need the fan for tonight. Okay, it's not on. Something is just disturbing me and making noise. Okay. Or oh, one of the microphones there. Please, can you bring that mic to me? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay? So, we said as believers, we, we engage in spiritual warfare with the understanding of the victory that Christ had won for us. And therefore, what we do when we engage in spiritual warfare is to reenact the victory that we have in Christ Jesus over our enemies. The devil knows that he has been defeated already. He's so much aware of that. And therefore, we don't fight as defeated people in God's house. We don't fight as defeated people as Christians. We are not defeated. The devil rather has been defeated when Jesus Christ died on the cross. Praise the Lord Jesus. One that the Bible tells us the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. The Bible says, having the sound principalities and power, the Bible says it made a public show of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So that is our stand. But according to our promise last week, we said we are going to be looking at a case study today from the scripture, a character in the Bible, a man that went through storms, that went through hell, so to speak, a man that went through difficult times, that went through trials, a man whose challenge cannot be compared to yours. Honestly speaking, I've not seen anyone in this church whose challenge can be compared to the challenge of this man that we are going, we are going to be treating tonight. And this man, in spite of all his struggles, he came out victoriously. And the, what was the key to his victory? In my judgment, it was love. Therefore, we're looking at the character in the Bible today. That character is not that person than Job. Job. That's the character we want to look at today. Remember, our subject matter again is love the way to victory. Job. I'll be, look, I'll be reading at, I'll be reading the book of Job, rather, from Job chapter 42, verses 10, 11, and 12. Job 42, 10, 11, and 12. I read from the NIV. Just want to do a panorama of the book of Job. Panoramic study of the book of Job in its entirety. I'm going to be pointing out to some of the things in his life. Job chapter 42, 10 to 42. I guess our Bibles are open to the place already. When you have it, say amen. Oh, Job is not far-fetched from the Bible. It's not so hard to get. Before Psalms, you get Job. When you have it, say amen. Okay. What means here? Are you there? Where is your Bible? 
Okay, Job 42, 10 to 12. I read. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. 11. All his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him before came and ate with him in his house. They comforted and consoled him over all the trouble the Lord had brought upon him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring. Verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 4,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. Wow. So, now, what about this man, Job? By the time I begin to examine this life, I trust the Lord to minister to you and I tonight because some of the reasons why we complain, why we murmur, and, and, and sometimes we are discouraged, we don't want to serve God again, we don't want to come to church again. By the time we begin to, you know, compare our life, our lives vis a vis the life of this man, we may just have to go back home tonight and just say, Father, I thank you. Just thank you for everything. I pray God we minister to us in the name of Jesus. The book of Job is one of the major books in wisdom literature of the Bible. That's what they call the book of Job, wisdom literature. It's part of the wisdom literature of the Bible. It is a thorough analysis of the relationship between suffering and divine justice. Put in a dramatic, poetic form. The author of this book is unknown. And we cannot be too sure of the date of its authorship. That's not our concern for tonight anyway. But it must have been written during the time of the patriarchs. Job was one of the patriarchs of the Bible. Job lived during the time of the patriarchs. Who were patriarchs in the Bible? In the Bible study. Remember the Bible we say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those three people were the patriarchs of Israel. They were their fathers, their founding fathers. Do you understand that? Their ancestors, so to speak. So Job lived during the time of the patriarchs. Some said he lived before Abraham. You know, and there are several reasons why we must actually to some extent accept this postulation that Job must have lived during the pre- what do you call it? A Petraka period. You know, but that's not our concern for today. We just want to look at the life of this man. Now, this book of Job raises some pivotal questions in the mind of its readers. Like it raised in my own mind too. There are questions like, is God just? These are the questions that we have to ask when we are reading the book of Job. Is God just? Is God a just God? No. Questions like, why should bad things happen to good people? These are the questions we see in the book of Job. Why should bad things happen to good people? Now, now, let me tell you the real fact. Few years ago, I think that should be two years ago, there about when the news broke out that the great man of God, Dr. Miles Morrow, died in an accident. Preparing for a conference that had to do with God. Sincerely speaking, I lost my confidence in God when I heard the news. And the next question I asked myself was, God, if mice would die in an accident with his wife and about nine people there about, then what is my lot? What assurance do I have that when I go on this express, I will not die the same way too. If this man has been serving the Lord since the age of 17 till around 60 when he died and he had won several souls for Jesus both in the secular and, and in the sacred environment and yet God will still allow such a man to die in such a manner. Then I ask myself, then, what is my plight? What is my Lord? Am I sure I'm secured at all? Does it worth it putting all my trust in this God? 
that was the question that, that, that came to my mind. I must be sincere with you. Until one day, the man called Ben Carson, who many of us know him very well, we must have read his book, we must have seen his movie, movie written, I mean, I was acted on, on his behalf. Ben Carson now made a statement, he replied to the world, he said, the same question was on his mind, so somebody asked him the question, same question, and he said the Lord spoke to him that the same place I was when my only begotten son Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross is the same place I am where my died. The same place I was when they were stoning Stephen and I did not tear the heaven and cause earthquake. Stephen died in active service. I think you know that. Serving the Lord. The same place I was when that happened. It's the same place I am now. I've not left my throne. The same place I was when they killed all my apostles. Peter, Paul, Andrew, James named them. They killed them in persecution. And God seemed to be silent. The same place I was then. That same place I am now. Wow. And that simple statement touched my heart to confess that God, you remain God forever. You remain God forever. But one thing is certain in the case of such a man that death is no longer a banishment for believers. Death doesn't banish us from God. Rather, death brings us closer to him. It brings us one on one to our makers. Like the, the, the oath, the, the confession couples will make on the altar before the minister of God. We said, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, until death do us part. But in the case of a believer, now when a believer dies, the statement becomes, until death brings us together. Wow. So the man did not lose out. What happened was a transition. But that is not what I'm going to do. I'm trying to raise some of the questions that comes to our mind when we study the book of Job. So questions like, why should God allow bad things to happen to good people? Questions like, are all evils the result of human sin? All the evil happen on earth today. Volcanic eruption, that is cosmic evil. Or metaphysical evil, whatever you want to call it, or moral evil, spiritual evil, somebody will sleep last night, will not wake up the following morning, somebody will die with cancer, haven't served the law for several years, somebody will just set his child on heron, and a, a car will, will, will just crush him down, a car driven by a drunken driver will just crush him down, Somebody going on the, on the, on the highway and I tell someone will fall on him and he dies. The question is, are all evil occurrences the result of human sin? If we say sin caused everything. If we said sin caused everything. Therefore, that begin to raise questions. What about those who know no sin? What about a newborn child that never sinned before? So, such, things, you know, such questions begin to come up when I approach the book of Job. That's, that's the place I'm reading presently. Book of Job. Now, begin to ask such questions. Questions like, why should God remain silent when the just are suffering? Now, I'm not the only one asking this question. I know many of us could have been asking the same question. I remember the book of Psalm 78. Asaph was the writer of that Psalm 78. Not Psalm. Not, not David like you used to think. When of us think all the Psalms were written by David, no. David wrote the larger portion of Psalms. Then we have Solomon as one of the authors of Psalm. We have Moses wrote Psalms too. Then we have Asaph. Asaph was having the same problem, asking the same question. One of the questions that Asaph was asking was, is it in vain to serve God? Why will the wicked be prospering and the righteous suffering? 
And God seemed to be indifferent about it. How could God allow the wicked to live longer, even than the righteous? Why are the wicked taking prominent positions in the nation? And that the righteous are treated as paupers in the same nation. And the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And even his own people are treated as second class citizens and God will not, even, will not talk all the same. So that was a question in the mind of Asaf. Again, Habakkuk had the same problem too. The whole book of Habakkuk, we're going to read the book of Habakkuk very well. We're going to understand his argument. It was like, God, there was so much injustice in this place. These evil people had killed your prophet, and yet you just you refuse to do anything about it. You are just so quiet. He accused God of inactivity. He accused God of indifference. Habakkuk accused, accused God that God, you are just apathetic. You are just, you are just indifferent about all that was going on. People are troubled, you know, justice. They no longer seek justice again. They have killed your prophet. They've done honor of evil. The rich were oppre oppressing the, the, the poor. And the God seemed not to see anything. So that became a problem to Habakkuk. And God said, Habakkuk, I'm seeing what you are seeing too. I could see all of those things. Because I don't want to do something very soon. That even when you are told, you will not believe it. And he said, okay, what are you going to do? What do you have a plan to do? And God, to have a cock, it was as if God added salt upon injury. Salt to injury. Because God said, I'm, I am going to raise the Babylonian soldiers. I'm going to raise the Babylonian king against this wicked people in Jerusalem. And my said, God, wait a minute. How can you use the Babylonians are even more wicked than your people to still discipline them. Is that not injustice? And God had to correct him. Don't worry. And Abakob, the Lord gave him the word and he said, the just shall live by faith. So, that has been the question coming to the mind of men. Each time we, we, we face challenges, why do I have to pray and pray and pray and pray and God claims to be my God and nothing seems to be happening and someone that will not even pray at all that will go to the Bible to drink himself to stupor and will be getting the contract just on a platter of gold what is going on here? these are some of the questions that comes to mind when we read the book of Job again our subject matter is love the way to victory we started last week describing what love is scripturally and today we say we want to look at a case study and that's the man called Job how Job overcame how to scale through all his struggles and what was the key to Job's victory? I said in my judgments, in my judgment, the key to Job's victory was love and nothing more. I'm going to be examining that. So let's go to the study straight away now. We say, although the concern of this sermon is not theodicy, it's not to argue that God is good in the face of evil or God is not good. That's not the the the, the, the the concern of my sermon today, the concern of this sermon is to see, to learn from Job how Job with the key called love, how he was able to overcome the challenges of life or his own personal challenge. Okay, so we are going to be doing a panoramic study of the entire book of Job. I trust the Lord to minister to us in the name of Jesus. Okay, so let's start with Job. Job's trust in God. So I have just three points to discuss. The first is Job's, Job's trust in God. The second is Job's trials. And the third is Job's triumph. Again, the first is Job's trust in God. The second is Job's trials. And three, the third point is Job's triumph. Let me start with the first one. Job's trust in God. Job chapter 1 from verses 1 to 4. The man Job. Who was the man Job? One of the greatest testimonies a man can have. One of the greatest compliments a man can have. Is the compliment that comes from the lips of God himself. The Lord said about Job. 
He said to, to Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? Wow, what a testimony! What a testimony for God to recognize you as his own servant, as his own son. What a great privilege for God to address you as a son. And that was the, 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 the way God actually described Job. And let's see from the scripture what the Bible says about Job himself. From the book of Job chapter 1 from verses 1 to 4. Like I said, we are doing a panoramic study of the book of Job. Job 1 verses 1 to 4. Let's read quickly. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. Wow. We are trying to meet the man Job now. Let's meet the man. I'm trying to introduce him to you. The Bible says, This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. Greatest man in wealth, in property, whatever you want to call it. So let's talk about Job's trust in God. From this place that we have read, we see that Job was a man who trusted in God. And how was his trust measured? How do we measure a man who trusts God? Who had his trust in God? It is not simply by coming to church and lifting up holy hands and shouting and dancing and blasting in tongues. It is far more than that. Trust in God starts with the acknowledgement of who God is. The Bible says, for he that must come to him must believe that he is. And he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So that's the first step to trust in the Lord. Acknowledgement of who God is. Secondly, trusting in God also means the acknowledgement of who you are too. And what should you acknowledge yourself to be? I don't know yet of our own inadequacies, of our own inability, of our own limitations. These are vis the person of God. When I compare myself to God, when I acknowledge him, I acknowledge him in his sovereignty, in his almightiness, in his, in his sufficiency, in his all sufficiency. And when I see myself, I see myself debased compared to him. I see myself inadequate compared to him. I see myself in something insufficient. I mean, in compared to him. In other words, when you learn to acknowledge him and you acknowledge your own inability too, then that is the starting point of trusting in the Lord. Because until I acknowledge that I cannot do it, I will learn how to trust him. I'm not making any sense to you. Now, the Bible tells us the book of Proverbs chapter 3 from verse 5, from verse 3 to 6, brother. Let me just paraphrase that. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. It, 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 the Bible tells us how to go about it. Do not lean to your own understanding. Why? Because my understanding Cannot take me to where I'm going. My understanding is limited. I don't know all the way ahead of me. He is the way. I am not the way. So I must depend on him to walk on the way. So that I don't miss the way. So do not lean to your own understanding. In all thy ways. Acknowledge him. And shall direct your path. That's the way it works. So, we said, trusting God starts with the acknowledgement of who God is and the acknowledgement of our incompetence without him, inability without him, insufficiency without him. In other words, 
He is our sufficiency. He is everything to us. And this was the man too. He acknowledged God. He trusted in God. So let's see. How can we measure the trust Job had in God? We said Job was a man who trusted in God. So that's our first point. Job's trust in God. How do we measure his trust in God? Number one. He was a man who loves God. Job loved the Lord. He loved God so much. That's one of the ways we could see. One of the ways we could measure his trust in God. He loved God. Again, another way we can describe the word trust apart from acknowledgement. He is, by what we have just mentioned now, love for God. It's another way we can actually measure our trust in God. Obedience to God. It's another way we can measure our trust in God. But we say the first one from, from the life of Job, Job's trust in God, how do we measure that? He was a man who loves God. Number two, how do we measure the trust Job had in God? He feared the Lord and shunned evil. Job feared the Lord and shunned evil. We saw that in verse 8 of Job. Verse 8 of Job. Then the Lord said to, to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who feared the Lord and shunned evil. Wow. What a commendation from God about a man. That God could call Satan and say, Have you, have you considered my servant? Maybe you are going to say something different from what I'm saying about him. Go and consider it first. But what I know is that he loved me, he feared me, and is the man who shunned evil. So that's what we saw in Job's life. So number three, he was morally upright and pious. To be pious means to be holy. He was morally upright and pious. We say that in the book of Job, chapter 2, verse 3. Job 2, 3. Job was morally upright. Verse 3 of Job 2. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job the second time now? There is no one like him on earth. He's blameless and upright, a man who feared the Lord and shunned evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him. To win him without any reason. So Job was morally upright. A man of integrity. A man you can do business with and you will not be afraid. He's going to dupe you. No. You can do business with him. You can entrust your properties into his hand. He was a man of integrity. And uh, let me explain the word integrity to us. The word integrity means to be integral. To be whole. Not as if you are good in the church and you are evil outside the church. That is not integrity. You are not only before your parents and when you get to school you become something else. That is not integrity. That is living a double standard life. Integrity means the man was who he was at home. That's the same person he is. Anywhere else of the world. Do you understand that? So Job was a man of integrity. Let's see more about Job. He was a regular worshipper of God. Job 1 verse 5. Attest to that. Job 1 5. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send, would send and have Sorry, Job will send and have them purified. Early in the morning, we will sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking perhaps my children have sinned and caused God in their heart. This was Job's regular custom. The sacrifice, the important sacrifice, they're talking about worship unto the Lord. 
That's worship. So Job was a worshiper, a regular worshiper of God. That was his trust in God. Number five, he carried his family along. Job was a family man. He wasn't a good daddy to people on the streets and a bad daddy to his own children at home. You know, I'm thinking of writing a book maybe in the future and I'm going to title, Mom, can you please give us another daddy? You know, as, as funny as that. I'm trying to picture a dad that's never at home with his kids or never have time for them and the each time these children go to school and their, 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 their mate, their peer group tells them about their dads, they are just like, oh, I wish I had this kind of daddy too. And just then I say, Mommy, we need another daddy. But that was not true. Job spent time with his own family. After his children had gone feasting, gone for party, Job would go to offer sacrifices to the Lord on their behalf. Perhaps they must have cursed God when they were marrying. Job was a people person. He loved people. He loved his family. That was Job. Number six. He was favored by God and saw God as the source of his blessing. That's Job 1 verse, verse 9 to 10. Job was favored by God and saw God as the source of his blessings. That was how we could measure Job's trust in God. He loved God, he feared God and shown evil, he was morally upright and pious. He was a regular worshiper of God. He carried his family along. He was favored by God and saw God as the source of his blessings. Now, these are the points at which I start asking my question. Despite all of these commendations, good things we have read about this man, should God allow evil to befall such a man so pious? That would shun evil. That, that feared him. A worshiper of God. A man who will carry his family along. He was morally upright. A man of integrity. Why should God allow evil to happen to such a man? Right, like I said, my concern today is not to raise an argument about the justice of God in the face of evil or not. I'm not trying to do that today. We are trying to look at the life of a man in spite of his trust in God. Such a man went through trials. And that brings us to the second point. Job's trials. Job trusted God. Yet, Job had trials. Now, how do we reconcile that? Trust in God, measured by faithfulness, by uprightness, by by piety, by fearing the Lord, by worship, and yet he had trials. Do you measure that? Now, let me go back to my usual statement. God does not promise us a smooth sailing. He only promised us a safe landing. He didn't say all the way. The journey will be smooth all through the way. No. But he said, don't worry. I will take you to your destination safely. That is what he has promised. Even Jesus himself, when he was going to the seven, he just crossed over to the other side of the lake. Storm came to threaten even the journey of our Lord. How much more you and I? I don't want to face anything. That seems to be part of life. Trials. So Job was in the midst of his own struggles. He faced, I bet it many of us have not seen one thought of what Job faced. And I pray we shall not face them in the name of Jesus. 
Because this one that we have missed, I think is enough for us. God just take, care, take us out of that. But let's see the trials of Job. Job's trials. From chapter 12, Job, verse 7 and 8. Job's trials. I'm just going to run through them. Chapter 2, Job 2, 7 and 8. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scrubbed himself with it as he sat among the ashes. From throne to ashes. It was, it was a wealthy man. The Bible called him the, the greatest man in the East. Sitting on throne and now found himself because of his trial. Sitting in ashes. Wow. Those trials. Let's see. Number one. He lost his children just in one day. He lost his children, ten children, just in one day. That was his trial. What a great challenge. He lost his children just in one day. His servants and his home. He lost his children, his servant, and his home. For those who have been wealthy before, they know what it means not to be wealthy again. It can be so painful. My wife was sharing with me some, some a woman some times ago during the time of tsunami. You know what they call tsunami in the corporate world? When there is mass retrenchment. They said, everybody go home now. The husband used to be an MD in the bank or whatever, or a manager, a branch manager in the bank. And the, the husband went with the tsunami. And the one day, the woman had to cook whatever they call it, that kind of fish. Or panla, this kind of panla fish. Uh -huh. But sold by these people. And the woman bought the fish. And the dust for the woman to begin to put the fish in her mouth, she began to cry. Now, how can I descend so low eating this kind of fish? And there's some people who cannot even afford that fish. One family has to struggle for a 200 naira worth of fish in their family. Family of seven. You have to dissect it, cut into two. I experienced that a lot. My parents would buy one long fish like that. Put it in segments. And uh, the tail, daddy takes the tail. The head goes to the mom. Then you have the middle, cut into two again. Then we have to divide the two. So that one middle, divide into two again. Give me one part. Give my sister one part. Remaining two, give my brother one part. Give Isaiah one part. Finish. I will be satisfied. Dancing, praising the Lord after the whole day. You don't complain because that was the best we could eat then. But this woman saw fish. But because that was not what she used to eat then, perhaps she must have been cooking maybe chicken or turkey or whatever they call it in her soup. But now, she has been dedicated to eating fish. And she began to cry. I was like, wow. But Job lost 10 children in a day. A servant went for it. Wealth during the time of Job was measured by the amount of servants they have to. So he lost his servant, he lost his home just in a day. What a dilemma! What a, a challenge! That was not all that he lost. Number two, he lost his business empire. Job was a wealthy guy, but he lost his business empire just in a day. What he struggled to labor for over the years. Let's quantify his business empire briefly. I, I've, I've done that before. Uh, uh, done a little research on that. Job had a thousand sheep. And he lost that in a day. Three thousand camels. Just in a day. Five hundred jokes of oxen. And it takes two oxen to make a joke. In other words, he lost one thousand oxen. In a day, he had 500 female donkeys that he lost in a day. So, now looking at the current price of all of these things in, in, in the labor market, American market, 
The current price of this, I did the research on that. What is the current price of a female sheep now? Female sheep ranges between $150 to $300. And if you had lost 1,000 sheep, that means you had lost 200, I mean, 2 million US dollars in just one day. Job lost 2 million US dollars just in a day. And a great deal of money. That could get you a house in Maguro and you still collect change. Wow. Job had camels too. He had 3,000 camels. And a camel in American markets now weighs between $6,000 to $12,000. So Job could have lost 50 million US dollars in a day. Does have to quantify the cost of one camel times than 3,000 camels that he lost. Again, Job had 500 jokes, joke of oxen. That's a bull. And one bull cost $2,000. So Job must have lost 4 million US dollars in a single day. A donkey worth or cost a thousand, I mean, hundred dollars. And he had how many donkeys? 500 donkeys. Wow. Wow. So Job must have lost another 100,000 US dollars in a day. So in summary, Job lost 56,000, I mean 56 million US dollars business empire just in a day. What a tragedy can be more than that. For a man to lose all of that just in a day. Job. He lost his business empire in his struggles. Again, he lost his physical health and well-being. Saul took over his body. He lost his physical health and, and, and uh, some consolers had to come to him, his friends, to console him and tell him several terrible words. And uh, instead of them to console him, they actually added salt, you know? Salt to injury. You know how painful that can be. Job lost the loyalty and confidence of his friends. Bildad, Sova, Elihu, and uh, there are four of them. But the first three came and they said, Oh, oh, look at you. You have been pretending to be holy all this while. You can imagine saying such, such a word to a man that is going through agony. Such a man that have just lost 56 million US dollars. That have just lost 10 children. His home and his servants, liquid assets, lost everything. Such a man that was so sick that they could not get the right medication for him. And friends had no other word to say than to tell him that I thought you said you are pious, I thought you said you are righteous. I perceive you have been doing something underground. You better admit your wrong and tell God you are a failure so that God can forgive you. So I said all manner of words to him. Read chapter 5 of Job, chapter 4, chapter 5 of Job. One of his friends started this, this, this statement, this dialogue. Started saying one of things against Job. He said, you better admit. Admit that you are a sinner, that you are wrong, that, that there is no righteousness in you. And so that God can have mercy on you. Their tongue were as corrosive as the poison, the venom of a snake. They never had good words in their mouth. May God take us far away from such people in Jesus' name. Because they don't come to help. They come to make things worse. So you can imagine, those who think they will provide succor for you in a time of struggle, they are the same people that are you know, causing more injury. The same people causing you more pains. The trials of a trusted friend can be so painful than the war of an enemy. I repeat myself, the trial of a trusted friend can be so painful than the war of an enemy. You know it's my enemy already. So if you place this war on me, I should not be too angry. But for a friend that you trust so much, not be the one trying you. Wow. Can be so painful. That was the problem of Job in his trials. Again, he lost everything he had except his wife. Thank God he didn't lose his wife. 
But in spite of that, look at what his wife suggested. The wife told him, Joe, you better curse God and die. Now, I wouldn't want you to blame the woman too much. Hmm? She was just emotional. She just lost 10 children. She lost her home. Perhaps she had become the head of the WI president of her community. Of whose? Head of women in that place. And she lost everything. People have been coming to her. Mommy, you want to do one party? You are going to buy clothes for us. She will buy. When my children could not go to school, she would pay their school fees. But now, she lost her own children. She lost her, her property. She lost everything. She had to be packing the shit of her husband. She had to be helping her husband to, to, to take care of her husband. Maybe to bath her husband. And she was like, God, this is too much for me. Job doesn't want to serve the Lord. I'm trusting in him. Curse him. And die. What is it of serving this God that will open his eyes? That's bad all that we have told to serve him. I'm watching you going through all of this hell. And you said, Curse God and die. Job said, No, I won't do that. Shall we accept good from God and not evil with it? No. Though Job in his, in his trial, Job got to a point that he had to cause the day of his birth. He said, cause me the day I was born. He said, that cause me the one that came to announce to my mother that I live. God, why can't you just take me away the day I was born before I was announced to the world that a child has been born? Why should you allow me to go through all of this hell? Wow, the cry of the man in agony. It was not an easy experience for Job at all. He had to cause the day of his birth, cause, cause everything about him. He wished he never lived at all. He wished his pregnancy could have been aborted even before he could see the light of the day. Because how, how, how can you console such a man that lost 10 children that are grown ups, grown up children already, lost them just in a day, lost his business empire in a day. And he had to be living at the mercy of people around him. I declare nobody will come to pay you evil visit this year in the name of Jesus. They will not console you badly in the name of Jesus. You know, we say, one, the Bible that's not known, and you look at Jesus. I declare no more will come and say, I want to come and pay him, pay up, no, let's visit in the name of Jesus. That was Job's lot. However, in all of his trials, Job, though he lost everything except his wife, and ultimately, his trust for God was not lost. Job trusted the Lord all the same. Trusted him. Oh, Job made a statement that I cherish. A tree, boat is cut off. But yeah, don't worry. It's a matter of time. It's going to sprout again. There is hope for a tree that is cut off because someday it shall sprout again. And Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. I know. Though he slay me, yet I will keep trusting him. I will hope in him. I will not deny him. Sometimes believers deny God. Believers will just will deny him because the Lord allows such things to happen to us. Excuse me. And whatever we are going through, all of our struggles, none of them diminishes God. None of our struggles make God less of who he is. He remains God. Whether you want to believe it or not, he remains God. And Job understood that. That God, you are God all alone. Job, Job complained. Complained. Nobody should say Job never complained. They complained. Ah. Job said, I ah, wish he could go to God in heaven. And plead his own cause there. His case there. And tell God, God, why, 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 what have I done? And in such a thing that happened to Job, wow, 
praying can be so difficult for those who have actually gone through some some storms in their lives it seems all hell is breaking loose around you and even when you praise i wonder how long job would pray for answer to come because what happened to job was like a battle between god and satan and until the battle reaches its climax because god wanted to prove to satan that i prove i want to prove to you i bet with you that this guy will not will not disown me this guy will keep trusting in me but satan was trying to tell god that god this man is not just loving you for loving your sake he doesn't just trust you because he wanted to trust you he's trusting you because of what you have done for him so god was trying to prove to the devil that man can love me in spite of what they have and what they don't have so you can imagine do me keep praying on heart here god please bind the devil i don't look good devil in jesus name and until the death gets to its climax prayers will not be answered wow that makes it more difficult more difficult because there was actually a deal between God and Satan, which Job knew nothing about. There are some decisions that are taken on our behalf that we know nothing about. And sometimes we keep fighting and fighting, wrestling and wrestling with, 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 with struggles in our lives, and it seems nothing is changing. But hold on, change is coming. It is not the change that proof can that can provide. The change that we anticipate in Nigeria, proof cannot bring the change. Umbrella cannot bring the change. I guess you understand what I'm trying to say. APC won't bring it. PDP won't bring it. I don't have APC man around us here. <laughs> that man is a politician. That guy here. APC won't bring it. PDP won't bring the change. It can only come from God. Because sometimes we go through stuff that we have decided in our absence. And we just have to go through life. You know, experiencing those that have been decided on our behalf that we knew nothing about. You know, sometimes on a negative aspect, some children are going through some hellish experiences that... What that, that didn't even, even come by their own decision, by their own making. Sometimes we make we, we, we use some statement like uh, it is what you have done yesterday that you are reaping today. But sometimes some people go through things that they knew nothing about. Some children are just suffering from the sins and the failures of the past generations that they knew nothing about. Can I have a witness in the house? But somebody was sharing with us two days ago there about, about the plight of our community here. And the person was like, oh, you need to pray that they heard from history. I don't know how to that history was. That uh, one, 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 one pregnant woman was a stranger, was, was killed for ritual in, in, in the community, the, the historical past. And, they, and she was like, I don't know anything about your ritual. Please don't kill me. I came to visit somebody. I was to me, but no. They were like, no. We are giving you over to our gods. And then the woman said, if you refuse to accept my plea for the sake of the child in my womb and for my sake that I don't know anything about your culture of this place, if my blood touches the ground, nobody among your children will ever rise to be somebody. And the strangers come to live in the same community. They don't know anything that has been decided about them. And they have to live in the same community. That's the life some lives today. They are not living because they are not going through their spores because of their own mistakes. Not because of their own bad decisions. But because of the decisions of their ancestors, their fathers, that they knew nothing about. But I have a good news for you. The Lord said, we shall not say this proverb again in Israel. That your father had eaten the salt grape and the teeth of your children are set on edge. The Bible says such a proverb will no longer be said again in Israel. I declare whatever your parents have done wrong, 
or your ancestors have done wrong in the past that have been having pop, I mean, negative influence upon your life by the power of Jesus to break them off today in Jesus' name. They shall not have negative impact on your life again in the name of Jesus. Job's trials, in all of his trials, to maintain his trust in God. And that takes us to the last point. Job's trials. How did he overcome his challenges? Job chapter 42 and verse 10. Job 42 verse 10. Oh. Let, let, let me just go through, take you through some things about this guy, Job, or this daddy, Job, or father, Job. Right, we want to call him now. Because we say he was one of the patriarchs. Before we get to chapter 42, verse 10, before we get to that point, you know, Job was complaining. And God was quiet from, verse, from chapter 1, where Job started the struggle. Till around chapter 30 something, maybe 38 or thereabout, God was just quiet. Wow. How do you feel when God said silent about your situation? When God seems to be folding his arms, to be indifferent about what you are going through. Oh, how do we justify the truthfulness, the almightiness, the power of God? In the face of evil in the world. Why are people suffering and God seems to be silent and is doing nothing about it? You know, that's one of the, the, the questions that came to the minds of men after the Second World War. When Adolf Hitler decided to wipe off all the Jews living on earth. That was his target. And he killed many of them, thousands of them in the gas chamber. Just to eradicate all the Jews. And people started raising the question if God actually exists, if He's the all loving God, if He's the all wise God, how can the all loving God allow a man like Hitler to destroy his own people and he does nothing about it? How can the all-powerful God create things or allow things on earth that are beyond his power? Some of the questions they ask after the Second World War. As if something had gone out of God's control. How will you say you are still living? And they are destroying your creation for you. Men are creating HH bombs, missiles, rockets, and things like that that could destroy everything on earth in the trick of an heart. And God seemed to be indifferent about it. Now, look at how God responded to Job. Let's start from chapter 40. Ho, ho, ho. From verse 1. I'll just read the first five verses in verse, chapter 40, verse from, from verse 1 to 5. Now we go to chapter 41, maybe 1 to 5 too. Because I want you to see some of the questions God asked Job in return. When God had to break his silence. The Lord said to Job, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Can you correct me? Who are you to correct me? Let him who accuses God answer him. Because I thought he accusing him. Why must you allow this to happen to me? What have I done wrong? Why me? The Lord said, He said, Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job answered the Lord. I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. Just to close it. Don't even talk at all. That's what he told himself. And he said, I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord said, okay, get ready now. Verse 6. The Lord said, Then the Lord spoke the job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you. And you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? How can you say, Lord God, I just go? <laughs> he said, Would you condemn me to justify yourself? 
Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? Then adorn yourself with glory and splendor and clothe yourself in honor and majesty. Let me stop here. Let's go to chapter 41 and verse, verse 1 again. The Lord started asking him again. Can you pull in the Leviathan? Can you pull in the Leviathan with a fish hook? Leviathan is talking like that's it, uh, the metaphor for a whale, a big fish. Can you use just a whale? I mean, a, a fish hook. Who can, can be so small? Can you just to pull a whale from the sea? The Lord said, These are the things I can do. But you can't do it. So I dare you question me. The Lord continued verse, you know, from verse 1 again. Or tie down his tongue with a rope. Wow. If you know, a living can also mean uh, a crocodile, you know, just talking about something big, something gigantic. Okay, verse 2. Can you put a cord through his nose or put a jaw with a hook? Put his jaw with a hook. Will he keep begging you for mercy? Will he speak to you with gentle words? Will he make an agreement with you for you to take him as your slave for life? Can you make a pet of him like a bed? Or put him on a leash for your girls, for your girls. Will you trade you butter trades? Or you be traders butter for him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons and his head with fish's spear? If you lay a hand on him, will you remember the struggle? I never do it again. You will remember that I never do it again. The Lord started asking him. The Lord asked him, Do you know the person that put rain, torrent of rain in channels? Not that rain falls in channels. Come and read, tom, 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 like that. Were you the one who did it? Were you the one that gave ostrich so much strength and speed, but no wisdom? The Bible says, according to the book of Job, that an ostrich laughs at the speed of a horse. As fast as horse is, when an, an ostrich is running, an horse is running, ostrich will laugh at as a horse that is walking. Oh, sorry, you, you, you. But ostrich has no measure of wisdom at all. An ostrich will lay its own egg, use its own leg to crush its egg down. No wisdom. And the Lord brought all of those things before Job. They says, God said, okay, answer me. I tell all of this before you. Give me answers to all of these questions. Look at those response. That's why we want to close for today. Chapter 42, verse 1 now. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No plan of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my, my counsel with that knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. I was just talking. Say, I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job said, I, I, I repent. I refuse to accuse you any longer, God. I refuse to accuse you. And verse 10. After Job, the Lord insisted that Job must pray for his friends. Though his friends, they hurt him so much. They spoke unfriendly words to him. The Lord asked Job to pray for his friends. And that, is the, that means there is an expiring date for every struggle. So, Job's struggle was getting to his expiring time now. Verse 10, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Now, let's see Job's triumph. How did he win his battle in life? He never stopped loving God and trusting him. Can you see? Love the way to victory. Job's triumph, Job's victory came by, by him keeping loving God 
and never stopped trusting in him because Job said, but he knows but he knows the way that I take. When he had tested me, I will come forth as gold. Though he slay me, yet I will open him. Job never stopped loving God and trusting in him. That was one of the things that brought his victory. Number two, he prayed for his friends that showed love and forgiveness. You must learn to let your offenders off the hook. Release them from prison. That's one of the ways of victory. So that those who have laughed at you can come to love with you. Celebration is not sweet when nobody, nobody's there to celebrate with you. I'm telling you. And the best people in your party are people that have actually relegated you in the past. That said they can't do anything good. They are the best people in your party, I'm telling you. They will serve any other person better than any other person that very day. They have to go and help you to carry prize and carry things because they want to prove to you that we are not as evil as you think. But if I ask God to kill all of them, oh, the party will not be so sweet that day. And Tony Kole Pago, Owankola Rarioni, they said, This one, no feet, you know, just go back to your village. You know, if you ask us for this Lagos, you are not living in Bakudu, in your own house. Wow. So those enemies that have loved at you, God will make them to love with you in the name of Jesus. Whether they like it or yes, because there's no option for no. Because God will transform your life after these struggles. And your enemies will come to celebrate with you in Jesus' name. So go pray for his friends. He forgave them. And uh, what was the result? God restored all that Job had lost fully with dividends. God restored all with dividends. He gave him children. Wow. The Lord blessed the latter verse 12. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. He had 4,000 sheep. 4,000 sheep. How many did he have before? How many sheep did he have before? He had 1,000 before. So God increased it to 4,000. Wow. Interesting. Okay. Let's see. He had 6,000 camels in place of 3,000 camels. Then, he has a 1,000 yoke of oxen in place of 500 yoke of oxen. And a 1,000 donkeys in place of how many donkeys did he have before? 500 female donkeys. What a mighty God. Well, right, let's see that again. And he also has seven sons and three daughters. The Lord restored what he thought had gone forever. How can I Give back to a child again. My wife's already old. The Lord said, Oh, menopause is what they call it. I can play what has been paused. It is not menopause. So even if it is paused, I'm ready to play it again to make it start working. And I will give back to you all that you have lost. The Lord said the same thing to you tonight. The Lord said, All the years that locals. Canker worm, palma worm, caterpillar had eaten your life. The Lord said he will restore back to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. He said he will rain upon you former and the latter and respectively in Jesus' name. We have lost so much things, but God is the reason why we have not lost all things. And all that you have lost in the past, they shall be restored in the name of Jesus. But not by the same quantity that you lost them in the past, shall be pressed down shaking together, running over, shall men put onto your bosom. The Lord shall increase you on every side in the name of Jesus. You are getting back all that you have lost with dividends in the name of Jesus. Two, who thought he had lost his health? The Bible says in verse 15, now nowhere in all the land where they have found women as beautiful as those daughters. Wow. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived a hundred and forty years. God added more years unto him. That the years of your struggle shall be replenished. Mm. So he saw his children and their children go wow, to the fourth generation. And so he died old and full of years. 
Praise the Lord Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. That was the life of Job. Job's trust in the Lord, Job's prayers, and Job's triumph. Okay, any question, any contribution before we call it a day?